Our service is about to begin. I would ask any of you who have any noise making devices or cell phones to please turn them to the off position. Officiating our service today is Rabbi Adam Shalom from Kol Hadash Humanistic Congregation. Today we're living in a new world, and not just because the service is being broadcast over the internet all over the world. It's a new world for the Handelsman family and heirs. As I said yesterday when meeting with the family to talk about this service, for Joy and for Susan, this is the first time they've ever been without parents. Even if the last few years it was they who were responsible for Mitzi rather than the other way around. But it is a new world for all of us. Maxine Kaplan, who became Mitzi Handelsman, was born 97 years ago. So none of us here and very few of, if any, of those watching have ever been in a world that didn't have Mitzi in it. It will take some time to get used to this new world, even if the Mitzi that everyone knew and loved had faded over the last few years. In some ways, it's like a cumulative loss. We've lost 97 years of love and presence and joy and energy and opinions. And even if we lost a few pieces at a time, now that she's finally gone, we feel the full loss. Still, 97 years is a pretty good run, even if we are living longer and longer. And Mitzi had a good run at her good run. She was golfing into her 80s. She was a role model for aging gracefully. At 92, she said, I'm not old yet. She once refused to take a new pill her doctor wanted to prescribe because she was already taking seven pills. And if he wanted her to take another one, she had to drop a different one. She never gave in to the weakness of being ill and she really only had a primary care physician, an eye doctor, and a dentist. And even when she did face the challenges of macular degeneration or hearing loss, she never complained. She always said she felt fine, she wasn't in pain, she didn't need anything. She never complained or whined. And in this, she was very appropriate and wise and a role model. In many ways, she was a role model. If we're lucky, this is the way of the world, to age, hopefully for a long time, and eventually to die. The wisdom of this truth is preserved in Jewish tradition in the Hebrew Bible in the book of Ecclesiastes, or Kohelet. I'll read a passage first in Hebrew and then in English. Et Svod et Chokod, et la Shlich Avanim, et Knos Avanim, et la Chavok, et Lirchok Mechabek, et la Vakesh, et la Abed, et Lishmor, et la Shlich, et Likroa, et Litpor, et la Chashot, et la Daber, et la Ehov, et Lisno, et Milchama, et Shalom. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, 
a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. If you knew Mitzi, you knew that she was always looking good. I understand she looks good even now. She was always dressed to the nines, as they say. Looking back, all her life together looks like a pretty good ensemble too. Running a clothing shop, a women's clothing shop for many years meant she knew how to put an outfit together. So maybe if we think about her life as a great outfit with the various pieces fitting together like a glove, that will help us organize all these memories that flood back in moments like this. You have to start with what puts your feet on the ground, your shoes or sandals, in this case, the beginning of Mitzi's life with her family. Roger might have said anything with soul, either one. Mitzi grew up on the north side of Chicago, which led to several lifelong connections. Yes, the Chicago Cubs, but also a large extended family that lived nearby. Even though she was an only child, some of her cousins felt like sisters, sisters to her because they were so close and spent so much time together. This was a tradition she wanted to continue with her own family, and she made a special effort later in life to travel together with her daughters and their families so those first cousins would be as close as siblings, even though they lived in different places, and evidence suggests that this social engineering worked. I believe that one person from that era, Phil Kroll, is still around, and he may well be watching this memorial online. Mitzi's father owned a liquor store at the corner of Sheridan and Howard. He most likely was a bootlegger. One piece of evidence from Mitzi's memory was seeing Al Capone's brother come to dinner once during Prohibition. Mitzi attended Sen High School and then Secretarial School after that. The family had limited funds, so she couldn't go to college. Instead, she went to work, starting by working as a buyer's office at the Merchandise Mart and then eventually becoming a buyer herself. Of course, once your feet are on the ground, you have to pick the most important piece of the ensemble, which is the dress, what everyone sees when they first see or think of you. For Mitzi, her dress was often bright red. You can see the choice of coffin color was not accidental. It was her signature color even when attending a grandchild's wedding. And it's hard to think of Mitzi without thinking of Lori, because they were always together. Shortly after the end of World War II, they met each other, he was 32, she was 24, and it was a whirlwind courtship. They met in February of 1948 and were married by July 18th of the same year. Mitzi kept a diary of most of her courtship, including tickets to events, menus from restaurants, even napkins and matchbooks. And she did the same diary keeping for their month-long honeymoon in California, a record of everything they did and saw. And these memory diaries became a template for their many travels together often taken as a vacation alone in February or as an all-family driving trip over the summer, complete with the alphabet game and quizzes and plenty of questions like, are we there yet? Together, Lori and Mitzi went to Italy many, many times, but also to China, to France. They took tours in Africa, even to South America when you had to get there on several prop planes. They were very adventurous together, and they also loved socializing at every stage of their partnership hosting and attending parties, always engaging and gregarious, a real presence. But they were always together. It started with a men's clothing store in Downers Grove called Herbert's, originally started by Lori's Lanslite, or people who were from the same shtetl in the old country as his family. But then it expanded to add the women's clothing store Lloyd's. The family story is that they were signing a lease on the building but hadn't chosen a name yet. And so the lease holder suggested, well, Lloyd's of London is a good name, so that's how they settled on Lloyd's. And at Lloyd's, which Mitzi owned and ran, she did everything. All the buying, the marketing, the management, the promotions, and she was probably their best salesperson too. Now Mitzi would have always said that she was not a women's liber, as they used to say. She often signed her name as Mrs. Lawrence Handelsman. 
And she had traditional ideas about a woman's role in the house as far as running the kitchen or about what girls should or should not be wearing or about how a wife should greet her husband when he comes home from work. But her example of running a business and speaking her opinions set a different example. She even warned Cliff when she was visiting Joy and Cliff's new apartment in Philadelphia. She said to him, we're going to be together for hopefully a long time. And it's my nature to say it like it is, to be honest and tell you my thoughts. You can either accept them or not, but I will tell you how I feel. Cliff was always impressed by her strength and her toughness, and no one could tell her what she could not do. Still, it was always Lori and Mitzi together. They worked next to each other every day. They ate three meals a day together most days, including coming home for lunch with the girls. They played cards together and golf together. When they walked together, you would see them holding hands. They were a model of a loving and supportive relationship, and they appreciated every day of their decades of life together. In some ways, it was as if two had melded into one. Their love story, their symbiosis, was the real theme of Mitzi's life the dress that covered everything. And so, of course, it was very hard on her when he died some years ago, but that's getting ahead of our ensemble. So once you've picked out the shoes and the dress, are you done? Not even close. There are always things that need to be added on, and often those accessories, like a scarf or a stole or a shrug, are a wonderful way of expressing your personality. The two most significant add-ons for Mitzi's ensemble clearly were her daughters, Joy and Susan. And they fit in well with Lori and Mitzi, for whom family was always a priority. They spent a lot of time together in the small town world that was Downers Grove in those days. Friday night dinners in the formal dining room was a must, complete with kiddish blessing and candles. And even during the week when the stores were open late, they would eat together at 5 p.m. before going back to work. And in the evenings, it could be card games or Monopoly, all kinds of family quality time. As Sue and Joy wrote to their mother for her 95th birthday, when we were old enough to work in the store, capitalized, our first job was folding socks. We graduated to licking stamps and envelopes on the monthly statements and sorting hangers. We eventually took turns at every position, cashier, merchandiser, inventory taker, and junior buyer. It didn't matter what the job was. You taught us there is only one way to do a job. Do it right. Give it your all. To know what was expected, all we had to do was look at you. You taught by example. Mitzi was indeed a perfectionist. Even though her parties always had excellent foods on an impeccably set table, even so, after Thanksgiving or Hanukkah or other event, she would sit down and evaluate how the party went, taking notes that she would then consult the next time to make sure she had the right quantities and qualities of everything. Even using retail terms like, we need a markdown on appetizers. And she could correct a little bit too much. She began with a great golf game. She would take lessons early in the morning before the store had to open or get up early to practice her swing before going out for a round. But she wanted a little more distance. And so she traveled and took a golf clinic with a pro that actually made her game worse. But she was always trying to do better. There was a light and a cheerful side to Mitzi too. She definitely had a sense of humor. She taught her daughters and later her granddaughters how to flirt. And there was the time she showed up early at Susan's apartment and surprised them both by finding Roger in a towel. As he wrote, she kind of cocked her head and gave me that knowing mischievous Mitzi wink that told me everything was okay. And fortunately, later that night when he made an off-color joke about the menu, asking her, do you want to get scrawled? Her eye twinkled as she responded, of course, but not tonight. Now, you cannot talk about Mitzi and Lori without highlighting their Jewish connections. Even though they were in Downers Grove with only a few other Jewish kids in the public school, Jewishness was an important part of their family life. They belonged to Oak Park Temple, since that was where their Jewish neighbors went and they wanted the girls to have local Jewish friends. And so they made the carpool trek there every Sunday for Sunday school. They were also members of West Suburban Temple which was conservative and more their religious style, and so they would go to services there on their own. Passover was a big deal for the family, and for many years, Mitzi would host a Hanukkah party for the many Jewish families scattered throughout the western suburbs. Joy and Susan remember them coming from everywhere to fill up the basement with kids playing dreidel, 
but they never saw those kids the whole rest of the year. They only showed up for the Hanukkah party one time a year. And Lori and Mitzi were very philanthropic, though generally to Jewish charities like the Jewish United Fund and the Anti-Defamation League. In later years, they brought the entire extended family on a 10-day tour of Israel in 1992, and they encouraged their grandchildren to take the March of the Living and Birthright programs and play in the Maccabi games. Mitzi even invented a new Jewish holiday called Good Friday. You may have heard of it from somewhere else, maybe over the fence there. Downers Grove on Good Friday basically shut down from noon to 3 p.m. that day. So Mitzi and Lori started a new tradition of eating matzo meal pancakes and inviting their store managers, Ted and Bernie, and the accountant, Jerry. So it became a big lunch event with three to four frying pans going at the same time. And Mitzi would make those pancakes fresh for up to two hours. It became a contest of who could eat the most. But then, of course, they all had to get up and go back to work. You see the ensemble coming together, the shoes, the dress, the accessories. But we're still not done. We haven't added the jewelry which often has the most sentimental value and gets added even later. These are the ornaments of Mitzi's life, her grandchildren, and then later her great-grandchildren, David and Barry and Diane and Danny and Jess and Joshua, Jacob, Levi, Spencer, Elliot, and Ilan. We'll be hearing from her oldest grandson, David, in a few minutes. Each of them had their individual relationships with Mitzi, and they have their individual memories of her, too. They remember visits in Boca Raton and Green Acres and Mission Hills, cruises and family trips around the world, and the food. Shrimp cocktail and brisket, mandel bread and pumpkin pie and moose cake. Many of these recipes live on in family life today. The boys and girls' experiences could be different. Some could do no wrong, and some had more challenges keeping in line with the rules. Clothing shopping could also be a challenge. As Diane and Jess were tomboys, Mitzi might suggest they buy a miniskirt. They would suggest buying cargo shorts. Eventually, they found some common ground at the end, maybe sparkly skate shoes. Each of those grandchildren and eventually great-grandchildren felt a special connection with her and have their own stories to share. The most important legacy they received from her was the importance of family and the connections between the cousins that were forged through all those vacations traveling together. As with most things in life, Lori and Mitzi achieved the goals they set for their family, and their family was the beneficiary of all their planning and efforts. The ensemble is almost done. We just have to check the makeup and the hair before going out. As Rabbi Sherwin Wine once wrote, exits, like entrances, have their own dignity. Mitzi handled the challenges of aging with grace, never complaining, never speaking ill of anyone or gossiping. Her basic decency always extended to those who helped her, particularly to Pearl Rodriguez, who has been her caregiver and companion for the last six years through Mitzi's increasing needs for help over time. By now, she's a family friend and appropriately here at our memorial service today. Those last few years and months were definitely a challenge, it is hard to go through 97 years unscathed, and losing Lori was definitely a blow. But Mitzi died like she lived, strong, with grace, in charge of her life. And yes, in case anyone was concerned or curious, she already voted. Can you see Mitzi in this ensemble of her life in your mind's eye? The shoes, the dress, the accessories, the jewelry, the makeup, the hair, the strong will, the twinkle in her eye, the joy of living, the whole ensemble. That's what we will remember in the weeks and months after today. That's the image she worked on her whole life. That's the complete package, the final print. Now I'd like to invite David to come forward and share some of his memories. Thank you very much. Um, be before I start, uh, there was one piece of jewelry that didn't get mentioned, and that was Lucy, her other great-granddaughter, and so I just wanted to make sure that she got mentioned as well. Um, there's a hole in my life today, and that was, it's the shape of my grandma Mitzi, and she was so special to me, and such a 
important figure in my life. Um, but over the last few days, I've, I've had time to reflect on, on her and her impact in, in my development and, and the memories I have of her and how she lives on through, through me and my actions and all of us. You know, she, she has a legacy that will not die here, you know, this week, but will live on through all of us. Um, you know, in thinking about it, it was weird. She is one of the only people I can say were, were there for my birth and for my bar mitzvah and for my wedding. And she came when my first born son came into the world. And there aren't a lot of people I can say that about. I think the rest of them are here. Um, so she's been with me through all the big moments in my life and the little ones. Growing up, visiting Grandma Mitzi was such an adventure. You get on an airplane and, and fly into Chicago in the big airport and get in a rental car and get lost on the way to the condo. We talk to the guard at the guard gate, which seemed so important at the time. But the most exciting part of the trip was when the elevator got to the floor of her condo and we'd get out and the door would be open and she'd be standing there with big hugs for all of us. And just the smells and the sounds of their place when they were getting ready for entertaining. Um, it is imprinted in my mind and I can, I can picture myself there. And being with grandma was, she was such a dignified and classy and just aspirational person being with her made you want to live up to her very high standards. And she held those standards in what seemed like the easiest way possible. She lived her life and it didn't seem like a struggle for her to set this very high example for the rest of us. It was, it was just who she was. And she always made me feel really special. Um, after my bar mitzvah, I got to take a trip by myself to visit Grandma and Grandpa. I remember they took me to see Phantom of the Opera, and we got dressed up all fancy, and it was at this, it seemed like the most beautiful playhouse. And it, it seemed like a fairy tale. Like, I was young, and it just, just such a special moment that I got to spend that time with them, just me. But it wasn't just the you know, the fancy parties and the going out dressed up and the dinners. It was the simple moments. You know, spending the night at their house and having Cocoa Pebbles for dinner <laughs> and playing gin rummy late at night at the kitchen table and watching golf on a tiny little black and white TV. It was the, the small moments, the intimate moments that I really connect with. Grandma was also a very adventurous person and a traveler. And the trips that she took us on are a part of me. Going to Israel and connecting with my Jewish heritage, you know, going to the, the Western Wall, you know, going to archaeological digs, Masada. You know, that's a part of, you know, our ancestry. And she brought us there and connected us with that. The trip she took with Barry and Dan and I to Italy I say she was adventurous. That might have been a little bit more of an adventure than she was bargaining for. <laughs> you know, she put up with our crude jokes <laughs> and our silliness and our staring contests. But not only did she deal with our nonsense with grace and composure, but she also showed us amazing historical sites and allowed us to appreciate things that maybe we weren't ready for, but, you know, we didn't forget. And not only those trips, but to use those trips to connect our families. You know, the Adelsons and the Riegers have bonds because Grandma Mitzi created those bonds. She made sure that we spent time together even though we were physically living far apart and that we didn't forget each other. And that's super meaningful in my life. 
So these are some of the memories I have of Grandma Mitzi. And when I look at my life today and how I live it, like I can see examples of her. Last summer when we were figuring out where to go on vacation and we decided to visit Dan in Los Angeles. And that's because of Grandma Mitzi's influence in creating our friendship. And we had an amazing time. But not only did Dan, Dan and I have an amazing time, but watching our kids continue that legacy, you know, splashing around in the pool, it was so beautiful. And knowing that our kids are going to have a relationship because we want them to, because Grandma Mitzi put that in us and showed us how important family is. Um, last week when I was baking a pie for my kids, you know, whose recipe did we use? It was Grandma Mitzi's pumpkin pie. And seeing her name on the recipe just brings back memories of her. Uh, she was kind enough to give us some of the art that she had on display. And now I've got it on display in my house. And every day when I look by it, I, I think of her and yes, how she was and how important a figure she is for me. And it makes me smile and you know, Grandma Mitzi lives on. She's a part of me. She's a part of all of us. And the things she taught us and the example she set, I think, go a long way to putting more good in the world. And I'm going to miss you, Grandma Mitzi. Can I ask if those who are comfortable standing would be willing to stand at this time? I invite you to respond to each line of this poem by Rabbi Jack Reimer with the words, we remember her. It's not in the booklet. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, together, we remember her. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember her. In the opening of the buds and in the warmth of summer, we remember her. In the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn, we remember her. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember her. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember her. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember her. So long as we live, Mitzi too shall live, for she is now a part of us as, together, we remember her. Let us pause for a moment of silent tribute to feel our love for Lori and for Mitzi together as they have made this transition to the next phase of existence. And we live here feeling the love we still feel for them. In Jewish life, we recall the wisdom of the book of Proverbs, Zecher Tzadik Libracha, the memory of a good person is a blessing to us. Please be seated for a moment. At this time, the casket will be lowered into the earth, into its final resting place. This can be a challenging moment for the family because it is a kind of final goodbye. And so I invite us to reflect silently on the connections we will carry with us from this space that Mitzi gave to all of us.
Before the vault is sealed, I will add some earth from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It's a site of meaningful memories for this family, but also meaningful roots for the Jewish people. I would like to ask uh, Mitzi's grandson, Barry, to come forward at this time. And those here again to rise for a moment for the recitation of the Kaddish, the traditional prayer for the dead. Yikadal v'yikadash shemed rabba, v'yalmad divrach yirusei, v'yamlech machusei, v'chai achon v'yom achon v'chai adacho v'es Yisrael, v'agalav z'man kari v'yimroni. Heshme Rabam in Brach, the Ola Muemaya. Is Brach, Vishtvach, Vipa Arvit from Avit Nase. Is a dar, Visale, Visalal. Schmidigrisha, Brehu. Leila min Kobe Hasha, Visirata. Pushbehasa, Nakamasa. Dami Ram, the Oma, Vim Rome. A Heshlama Rabam in Shemaya, Chaya Malenu. Valko Israel, Vim Ru. Amen. I say Shalom Bim Rama, Vuya, say Shalom. Lenu Vyako Yisrael, Vimur Ame.
One of the most beautiful and important mitzvot, good deeds or commandments in Jewish tradition is to participate in saying goodbye and burying someone we love. It is a one-way gift. We do not expect reciprocation. Instead, it is a chance for us to leave a piece of ourselves in this space and to participate in saying goodbye in a meaningful way. It is traditional to take a shovel full or two or three of earth as you're moved to put that onto the grave and then to return the shovel to the earth so each person in sequence may take upon themselves the merit and the responsibility of the mitzvah of honoring the dead. And so I invite first her closest family and then all those who are here to participate in this ceremony. There are also shovels on either side, so you can go to either side. I'll email Roger too. Very good. It was in the album.
Okay. Well, as a last as a last step to take to conclude our service, um, for someone who loved family and loved connections with other people, I invite you to turn to someone who's close to you and to embrace them, and that will conclude our service. We are formally uh, concluded at this time. Contributions to www.juf.org can be made in memory of Mrs. Handelsman. Thank you. Family should know no more sorrow.